Hey, how is everyone today? <laughs> You're in for a feast with the lovely Audra here. Um, good evening, everyone. <laughs> you got Audra today. Yes. Or tonight. Yeah, so Audra, the wonderful Audra, definitely someone I recommend um, to all of my clients. Um, Audra, I know on a almost week weekly basis is inundated <laughs> with people that I sent her way. Um, only because she's really, really good at what she does. So Audra is a nutritionist. She's been doing this for many, many years, you know, up to a decade. Um, even before that, studying in the field for many, many more years before that. Um, you can catch her at Planet Organic in Balham, where you know, she's got a team of people and I've met her lovely, all knowledgeable and all basically products of Audra's um, information and her, just the way she sees the body. So, yeah, she really, really good at what she does. I mean, I've personally seen Audra and she's helped myself, my family as well. And, you know, very knowledgeable in a wide range of things down to the DNA level, to the cellular level, to the very macro level, you know. Um, when you're in her presence, you, you just feel that you get that holistic nature. And, you know, it complements what me and Sahu does very well because, you know, a lot of the time we're looking at the physical aspect. Sahu, he will look a lot on the metaphysical and you know, all just all just the one for the food level and just really understanding our nutrition, understanding our health, understanding what to put in our body, you know, just you know, you're in for a treat and that will definitely uh let me move that one. Mute or okay, so you're definitely in for a real, real good treat today. So, yeah, I, I'm going to hand it over to Audra, and yeah, yeah, please, please do your thing. <laughs> All right, I'm just gonna unmute you, Audra. Thank you. Yeah, I'm unmuted. Right. Thank you so much, Chris. That's one introduction. <laughs> I feel like I'm gonna come in quiet like a mouse after that. But I'll tell you what, if you've got Christos in your life, in your corner, you've got a wing band right there. So thank you for that introduction. So um, I have prepared a presentation, but, you know, let's be flexible with it. If it's not meeting some slides, I'm just going to whiz past and some um, some things will stay on or focus on. If you've got any questions, I mean, we do a question answer at the end. But if something comes up and you want a bit more clarity, please have a, um, 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 put it in the chat box and we will respond. So I'm just gonna put, share my screen. Okay. So we have our intro page, start with the gut. We're going to cover a few things. We're going to look at, you know, gut health and why it matters, looking at how to improve your digestion. We're going to look at, I call it gut SOS, certain conditions that we're all familiar with that we could look to support and eradicate. Um, we're gonna look at supplements and botanicals at the end, but we, you know, we're gonna skip through some slides if I feel they're not really necessary or going to be covered later. So, okay, I'm just gonna move this window. So as Crystal said, my name is Audra Chikikera. I'm a qualified naturopathic nutritional therapist. And that really means that I believe in the power of food um, to engage the body's na natural innate ability to heal itself. Um, I'm also a primary school teacher, or I was a primary school teacher. So if, am I gonna be a school teacherish? Just tell me to stop that and <laughs> just drop that and just talk normally. So I apologize now because I do get a bit school mom -ish. Um nature lover i'm a real food advocate i really do believe in the power of food in engaging in healing um from a qualified side i do one-to-one -one private consultations i'm also a supervisor for health and body care in a very large chain store i'm a nutritional advisor on vitamins minerals and supplements and i do a lot of corporate wellness webinars 
like this one. So when you see that, you think, okay, all disease begins in the gut. This is something that's attributed to Hippocrates um, nearly 2,000 years, over 2,000 years ago. And when you see that, you think, hmm, not so sure that everything can start in the gut in that way. But research is actually backing this up. And over the past 20 years, there's been a huge um, explosion of research around gut health. And on the conditions you see on the screen, these are all attributed to poor gut health. So as well as digestive problems, which you expect if you're having a problem with your gut, it's also shown to be linked to mental health issues, including autism, um, weight gain, diabetes, chronic fatigue. You know, chronic fatigue, obviously, if your gut's not assimilating nutrients, you're going to feel a bit tired because you're not getting everything you need. But it's also implicated in cardiovascular disease, rheumatism and depression. So it's quite a lot, isn't there, linking this to gut health. So the gut health model I like to use is this one. So the role of the gut can be broken into four parts. So there's digestion and absorption, you know, the food we eat and getting nutrients from them. There's integrity and immunity, and I'll elaborate now in a few slides. Your microbiome is like the, it's a collection of microorganisms in the gut and they have a huge link to your well-being. And motility is just a movement of food. As you can imagine, if you've got a slow transit time, so if food is staying in your gut for a bit too long, that means toxins are staying in there. That contributes to constipation. On the flip side, if your transit time is really fast, you know, you eat and soon you need to go and have a bowel movement, then you're not absorbing everything you need from your food. So just a few fun facts about the gut. I call it the gastrointestinal tract or git. So I will call it git. I'm not calling anyone a name. It's just much easier to say git than that long thing. So just a few fun facts. Um, our gastrointestinal tract starts from the mouth, ends in the anus, and it's over 30 feet long. So that's um, the size of a double-decker bus, really long. And in the intestines, you've got some, they're like finger-like projections called villi. They help with absorption. When you unravel all of that and flatten it out, the space we have for absorption covers the size of a tennis court. So you can see how, you know, anything that goes wrong in the gut is going to have a massive impact on your health. There's um, the pH of stomach acid is between 1.5 and 2. So it's slightly weaker than battery acid. It's really strong stuff. And you've also got these neurons. So these are nerve cells in the gut. And the gut's actually called the second brain because of this role between the gut and the brain, which we are definitely going to talk about after this presentation. 70% of the immunity lies in your gut and your happy hormone, 90% of that is made in your gut as well. So it's just showing you a little bit of how important your gastrointestinal tract is. So let's do a quick walkthrough. This is our digestive system. So the mouth's not on there. Excuse me, digestion starts in the mouth. That's your mechanical digestion. You know, you chew your food, you moisten it with saliva, and that helps it really down to your esophagus. From there, it goes into your stomach. You have lots of stomach acid, breaks the food down, and prepares it for the next stage of its digestion. Most of the absorption actually happens in your small intestine. Whatever's not absorbed then goes into your large intestine. We reabsorb water from the large intestine and that forms a harder stool and goes through your rectum and then you pass, have a bowel movement, all honky-dory when it's working well. So I just wanted to say a little bit about the stomach because this is where our challenges start. So like I said before, the stomach acid is really strong, but did you know that your stomach can hold about four liters of food? I mean, it doesn't mean you need to fill it up because if you have that much food in your gut, you can't actually digest it because it needs room to move. Think about a washing machine. If it's packed full, you can't roll your, your clothes around and you can't wash them. So we don't really want to fill it up to four litres. But it's interesting they can hold that much, even though it's like the size of a... Actually, I'm not going to say this thing because I'm probably going to get this wrong. I will leave that one to Sahu and Christo to talk about the physiology of the gut. But in the gut, there is... In the stomach lining of the gut is one cell thick and that helps make mucus and without this mucus we would literally eat ourselves you know that stomach acid will burn through the lining and burn through us so we need this mucus that mucus also helps trap pathogens so it stops us getting sick i mean it's such a really intricate system isn't it but the point we'd like to go on to really is your gut sos these are certain conditions that we all suffer with our gut 
And some of them, we kind of just take them and we just um, normalize them. We just get used to it. You know, I hear people say, I've not had a bowel movement in two days or I feel really bloated after pizza, but they say it like it's the normal way to be. We've get to, we're getting used to tolerating a level of ill health, really. And even something as simple as bloating can have some serious things behind it. So constipation, did you know this? If you go for more, less than once a day, you're constipated. We need to be going actually at least twice a day. You eat three times most of the time. Two of those needs to come out. So if you're not going every day, that's a slight constipation. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the foods you can use so that you don't have to go and get laxatives because they're really, really bad for your gut health. Then of course, on the other side of constipation is diarrhea or you can get flatulence, some level of flatulence is okay, but when it's really smelly, like eggy, there's something going on in the gut. IBS, we're gonna talk about afterwards and, and reflux or heartburn. These are all common complaints people say they have from um, in the gut. And we're just going to look at the very first one. So bloating. One of the main contributors to bloating is actually not chewing our food. We eat in a rush. You know, the stomach hasn't got any teeth. So when you're chewing, your, you need to give it some time, break your food down. So this is the very first minimum. So if you're suffering with bloating, that's one of the first things I'd recommend. Just chewing your food thoroughly. How many times? 30 minimum. You need to chew your food so you can't tell what you've eaten. I know it sounds really disgusting, but honestly, your stomach hasn't got any teeth. So the more you can do in the mouth, the better. I'll tell you a quick anecdote. So when my goddaughter was about seven, we just had told her, oh, you need to chew your food a hundred times. Now she started in the play scheme, play center, and I was a senior play worker. So she came with me to the center. At lunchtime, all the kids had gone out to play. I'm thinking, Poppy, why is Celine in here? She was still chewing her food. I felt so so no, you don't need to do 100, but the point is chew that food thoroughly because that's how you're going to get all the nutrients out of it. So gluten you can reduce by herbal teas, you know, having um, something like a ginger or fennel after you've eaten or cardamom, chewing on a cardamom or even chewing on a fennel seed really helps with gluten. You might have to remove onions and garlic. That's the IBS picture, but we, I think we're going to do, put on a special um, thing in a few weeks, aren't we? So you might need to clarify that around IBS. Then sugar mm -hmm. alcohols. So things like sorbitol or maltitol, if you look at some food packages, you can see this, they're called sugar alcohols. If you tend to bloating, you might need to look at taking that out of your diet. And the other thing is you might need some digestive enzymes. And we're gonna talk about enzymes in a bit. Another thing that can cause bloating is low stomach acid. And this one, I really want to put some focus on. So like I said earlier on, your stomach is very acidic and it turns out there are certain minerals, you need a stomach acid environment so you can actually absorb them in your small intestine. So iron is really important, calcium, magnesium. And then the flip side of that is if you've got low stomach acid, you're not absorbing these. So that will contribute to hair loss. So one of the first things, if you're losing hair, get your iron levels checked. It's most likely your iron levels are low. So you can you know, have a, um, supplement with iron, or you can drink something like nettle, that's gonna boost your iron levels. Um, brittle nails, because you're not now getting calcium, and dry skin and hair because of the vitamin D as well. So those are the like top things you're gonna miss out on if you've got low stomach acid. And osteoporosis, it's low calcium, low zinc, low magnesium, and D3. So these all contribute, and this is just from low stomach acid. Now, the interesting thing about low stomach acid is that a lot of the time, when we have heartburn, we think it's a low stomach acid condition, um, as high stomach acid, we think, oh, I've got too much acid. Well, actually it turns out it's low stomach acid. So if you haven't got enough stomach acid, you know, picture this for a moment, you cannot break down all of that food thoroughly when it's in the stomach, which means some partially digested food is going to the next level, your small intestine. Now your small intestine isn't built to cope with little chunks of food. So that starts to impair the lining of all of your gastrointestinal tract. And some of that partially digested food starts getting um, fermented by the bacteria lower down. Now, you know what the side effect of whenever you do bacterial fermentation, what you get, you get gas. Now the stomach, there's nowhere for that gas to go. So it starts pushing upwards 
bringing with this some stomach acid and that's where you get that burning sensation in you know in your chest area so if you go to the gp the first thing they do is they put you on ppi and i'm going to share later on why ppis are not the greatest thing so there's a quick home test you can do to see if you've got enough stomach acid and it's a really simple one Put a teaspoon of bicarbonate of soda, a little bit of water, and you have this on an empty stomach first thing in the morning. And then you time how long it takes you to burp, right? So the, the chemistry is that alkaline and acid will react and they'll produce a salt and a gas. And that's the gas that you're waiting for. So if you burp within five minutes, yay, your stomach acid levels are all right. After five minutes, five to 10 minutes, over 10 minutes, you've got very low stomach acid. Now, in that picture, if you're getting heartburn, the worst thing you can do is take a PPI because that's gonna push that little bit of stomach acid down even lower. So this is what tends to happen. You know, you go to your GP, you get your stomach um, heartburn and they recommend PPI. PPI are proton pump inhibitors. Or meprazole, that's an example. So meprazole will lower your stomach acid, but you started off with low stomach acid in the first place. And what it does, like I told you, there's some minerals that need acid to be absorbed. So this is why you can lead to iron deficiency or B12 deficiency, brittle bones, all of these things, because you actually need that stomach acid to absorb certain nutrients. Now, PPI is also reducing the acidity of your stomach. Guess what else that stomach acid does? It is that powerful that it will neutralize quite a few foodborne pathogens. So can you imagine if you're now not having enough stomach acid, now even lower with PPIs, you're creating a really good environment for lots of horrible pathogenic bacteria to grow. So before you get tempted to do a PPI, do the home test first to actually work out if you are low stomach acid or high stomach acid. Another test you can do if you're getting a bit of heartburn, you could just try a little bit of lemon. If it makes you feel better, you have low stomach acid. Unfortunately, if it burns a bit more, that means you have high stomach acid. You might need to have um, some like a quick bicarb to just tone that down, to alkaline it. Now, high stomach acid is completely different. If you test for high stomach acid, then a PPI for short course is going to help. But for only for short course, because when you stop PPIs, you get this rebound effect, which makes it all worse again. So I'm all for, I'm so sorry, if you haven't had your supper, <laughs> this is so not gonna make you want to eat it. It's the Bristol stool chart. So the reason I'm giving you the home test for stomach acid, the Bristol stool chart does the same thing. It gives you a little bit of information about the state of your gut. And I think everyone should really have this on your toilet wall. And if you've got children, all my children will talk, they talk about poo in this way. Oh, there's a bit of food in there. Oh, it wasn't very, um, they can tell when they need to drink a bit more water. They can tell when they need a bit more fiber. It's a really useful diagnostic tool and it's really simple and it's free. So the first two, as you can imagine, those are your constipation, so very dehydrated, and also lack of fiber, too much meat, dairy. This can all lose, lead to constipation. Your number three and four, number three could do with a little bit more water, but number three and four are your healthy-ish poops. Number five, usually soft with ill-deformed edges. That's level of inflammation in the gut. Um, but number seven, normally you can get some people with um, IBS. They alternate between the constipation, number one and number two, or number seven. The number seven can also be um, inflammation in the gut, like a, a foodborne, food poisoning type scenario. So these are really useful to have so that you can self-diagnose and rec you know, change what you need to eat. Um, so if it's say highly constipated, you might want to improve and increase your fiber intake or have more water. The accessory organs, because I did, you know, we talked through the major ones, but your liver and your pancreas have a really important role to play. So your liver produces and your pancreas, they produce pan pancreatic juices to help you digest your fats, more carbs and protein. Your liver helps produce bile. You need bile to absorb fat so a really good way to know if your liver needs support is if your poos are looking a bit fatty or floating that means your liver needs a bit of support the good thing about these things you can actually support so much of this through the food that you eat so on here i've got the foods that are going to help boost your stomach acid production if they're low these are all easily doable 
Um, you've got apple cider vinegar. A lot of people say, oh, apple cider vinegar is going to affect the enamel of my teeth. If you dilute it in water and you knock it back or use a straw, then you can protect your teeth and then rinse afterwards. Well, your bitter foods, which I have a list on the next slide, help you produce um, digestive juices. So most cultures will have some level of bitter food. I'm a Nigerian. We have bitter leaf in our soups. We have, a lot of our foods have a bitterness to it. And that bitter, you know, these are wise traditions. They've always known this. You need that little bit of bitter to help you digest your foods better. Hydration is important because all of these things are gonna happen in a watery environment. You know, you need about four liters of water in your system for your digestion. There's about that much in your digestive tract at any time. So being hydrated really helps with digestion and absorption. Having a relaxed meal, taking that breath. I think the history of saying grace is actually part of that. Um, whatever it is you believe in, just taking that moment to relax and give praise and thanks for the food in front of you actually helps with producing stomach acid. A lot of the time we're rushing or we're distracted when we're watching television. So those sort of lifestyle habits we need to drop if you're trying to support your digestion. So when I talked about liver support, now I'm talking particularly about bitter food. So color loo is slightly bitter, not bitter enough. And um, bitter leaf, if you can get a hold of it, that's really bitter. You probably can't eat that neat. But just a little bit as a side dish is going to really support your digestion. So on the screen there are just a few bit of foods you can have. And I've put in this asterisk around grapefruit. If you are any sort of medication, grapefruit is not advised because it can make your liver um, not, re not reduce the, the strength of your medication. It can increase it. So grapefruit is one. If you're taking loads of pharmaceutical medicines, you need to not have that in your um, you can't have grapefruit if you're having that. Whew. Any questions so far before we talk about the onslaught, the things our digestive tract has to face on a daily basis? Yes, but yeah, no, brilliant so far, Audrey. I, I've got a question. Uh, maybe okay. others are thinking um, a similar thing. So um, in terms, because usually, for example, omeprazole. Yeah. You know, usually they give um, a meprazole with a lot of these strong ibuprofen in there. Yeah. So I believe from the doctor's perspective is to help with the lining. They always say to help with the lining of the stomach, etc. cetera. Mm. Um, from what you're saying, in a simple term, this stomach acid seems to, it needs to be one at the right level. Yes. And it acts as a buffer to allow a lot of things to happen when there's enough of it. Yeah. And it appears that there's a lot of things that happens which reduces the stomach acid. And then we're further taking other things wrongly that will yeah. further reduce the stomach acid. Yeah. Is that correct? That is correct. And you find, um, like, the if you look at how many people have osteoporosis yeah. and how many of them are on PPIs, so mm. if you've been tested, that's the thing. If you've got the test that shows you've got too much stomach acid, then omeprazole is fine, only for mm. a short time. And whatever dose they give you, take half of it. You don't want too strong because when you stop taking it, like we said earlier, that acid then gets produced even more. Well, they're not testing before you're giving omeprazole. So low stomach acid, high stomach acid, the same omeprazole, and that's the problem. So there are tests that can be done to check if you have got high stomach acid, where they put a, a camera down, um, and uh, if the acid then burns the end of this camera, then they know it's too much acid. Mm. But NHS is not willing to commit to doing these tests. So they put people on omeprazole and then they wonder why we're not getting better. So mm. it's more the lack of testing that's the problem. Omeprazole has its place, I guess, but there are also things you can do. I'm, I'm sure you're going to talk about those. There are things you can do to help reduce stomach acid without going through the omeprazole picture mm. as well. Mm. Thanks, Christos. So on here, Oh, brilliant. This is just a brief, sorry, this is probably not the right um, physiological drawing. <laughs> I'm sorry, Sahu, <laughs> this is quite pretty and pink. But the, the point <laughs> is, this is just showing me. Healthy gut is trying to show a healthy it. gut. That's like a healthy gut made in plastic. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the point of this is, so 
when you look at your gastrointestinal, it's actually not part of us. So think about this for a minute. When there's food inside of here, it's not inside of us. It is just in this tract. The tract is a hollow tube. I know it's, it's, it's crazy, right? So this is almost like, um, it's not almost, it's our interface between the outside world and the inside world. While food is in here, it's not in us. It's only when it gets absorbed into the bloodstream that it becomes part of us. And the reason that interface, so you can think about, you know, the body does this thing. If it has a role, its function has to match the role and the way the physiology, physiology of it will also explain what it does. So because it's an interface between anything to get into the body has to go through the system, which means it has got to have ways of keeping pathogens out. The lining of this on the inside has got to be intact because if there's any sort of leakage, can you imagine what's going into your system and creating inflammation? So on the screen, pathogens, we are facing them either in your food, in the air, in the water, and you get into, the, especially into the stomach acid, it is burnt, it's gone. Same with stress, stress destroys the stomach. That's another thing. You know, think about it. If you've been chased by a lion, which we don't get to do because we live in London, uh -huh, we live in the city. But if you've been chased by a lion, you're not gonna stop to eat, right? Your digestion is just gonna go, it's gonna slow down so you can escape. And that's why stress is so bad for your digestion. On the other side is just general inflammation. It can be from how you're living, from the food that we're eating. That also has an impact, especially on the lining of the gut. And then on here, I've just put in your food intolerances. There are certain foods that we all probably know. I think everybody knows what they're intolerant um, to. It's just how much you're prepared to put up with the pain. Before I got trained, I knew whenever I had bread, I got this burning sensation on my back. But I thought, you know what, well, it's fine. Just a bit of burning. Yeah, it turned out I was damaging my gut. So we know when we're eating things or doing things that are making us really stressful and impacting the gut. And we've just got to start looking to eliminate those. So around your food intolerances, you have gluten, salicylates is in some tomatoes, I mean, like your histamine um, in food. The names are not that important, to be quite honest. The point here that I'm trying to make is that if you're eating something that doesn't agree with you, it is creating inflammation in the body. But one that I like to make a particular point about is dairy. Now, most so six in 10 are lactose intolerant, which means we don't create enough of the enzyme lactase to break lactose down. But guess what? For Afro-Caribbean, that number goes up to eight to nine in 10 people cannot digest lactose, can't have dairy. And I mean, who wants to anyway? I mean, baby cows should have their milk, not fit for human consumption. <laughs> but I'm not gonna preach, you know, to everyone to each his own, but I am saying this, if you tend to get diarrhea when you've had a dairy or a tummy ache, that is actually pointing towards an intolerance. So you might need to take that out. So just a few substitutes. If you're having to, if you're struggling to give up dairy, there are lots of replacements you can try, um, which have very little lactose in there. So you're going to be fine. If you do insist on dairy, then this thing down here, lactase, is an enzyme that's gonna break down lactose. And that's one way to carry on doing it. But ultimately, if something doesn't agree with you, why would you want to keep on eating it? So quickly, the next arm um, of that, um, my gut health model would be your immunity and integrity. So I've talked a little bit about it, you know, your gut lining, the stomach acid, but more importantly is something down here called your microbiome, which is a collection of bacteria that live in the gut. But before that, just a little bit around the horrible foods we've started to eat. Um, it was, does it shock anyone that now 56% of our energy intake is from ultra processed foods. So your burgers, your fries, the crisp, the nachos, the carbonated drinks, the bagels, the donuts, all of those things. But this is how these ultra processed things are defined. I've given you time to read it. I'm not going to read it out. But as you read that, there is nothing there that suggests it is food. So this is one of the main things that is driving unhealthy guts. 
Was that 50% you said? 56. So this 56. was um, um, wow. research done in 2021. Wow. And it was 56% of people's energy intake is coming from this muck. And it is muck, it is not food. Wow. And how is this affecting you? So how you can tell these foods, they're high sugar, low in fiber, like no fiber, stripped of nutrients. Whenever you get a packety thing, you get any of these foods, they always have niacin added in and folates. They're putting the nutrients back in because they don't have any to start off with. Why would you be eating anything that hasn't got any nutrients in there? And the things they're going to add in are not the things you will find in nature. They're the synthetic version, which most people cannot absorb very well. They're too much salt. They have additives. All of these things have a negative impact on gut health. And on the right there, I've listed a few of the negative effects you'll find if this is being, if it's making a significant contribution to your diet, these ultra packaged foods, the ready-made foods, the microwavable foods, if they're having a big percentage, you just want to lower that down. You know, if it's a struggle, think of the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of the time, you're eating whole grains, wholesome foods. 20% of the time, hmm, I'd make it even less. You might go for one of these, but they're not doing us any good. That's a problem. So you can see here, it reflects your blood sugar because it hasn't got any fiber. The foods are not filling. In fact, there was research done in the University of Michigan a couple of years ago, and they were looking at, uh, they were comparing the addictive qualities of fast food with cigarettes. And guess what? Equally addictive. That's why, you know, people, once you have this as a major part of your diet, you're going to eat a lot more of it, but it is not doing you any favours. So on here, you have increased risk of so many diseases. But the part that I want to focus on now is the damage it does to your microbiome. So in your large intestine, you have a lot of microbes. In fact, 100 trillion. We are more bacteria cells than human cells. They outnumber us 10 to 1 and they live mostly in the large intestine. I mean, it's the called, it's almost like um, it's an organ in itself, the bacteria in the gut, and they have immense contributions to make to health. A good way to top up your um, microbiome, getting those nice nourishing microbes into your gut is through eating fermented foods. Um, any fans of fermented foods? I mean, in my country, we have ogiri stinks. It's like fermented sesame seeds. Ooh. I'm sure every single culture on this planet has a fermented food because our ancestors understood gut health. You know, a lot of our history has been lost and we don't know about these things, but every single culture on this planet has a fermented food. Um, let's hear you. Who's having fermented foods in their diet? What are you eating? You put me on the fermented ginseng. One yes. Yeah. How are you finding it? No, brilliant, brilliant. It seems to, the effects of it seem to be a little bit quicker yeah. than the, the normal um, mm. gin thing. So yeah, no, really good. Uh, let's see in the chat, anyone in the chat? So what would be what would be a, a fermented food known from in the Caribbean? Um, you've got paimi. Yeah. There's tamale. I think it's called pie me or um anyone know this one yet? It starts with a D. The oh fermented maize, I think it's from. I mean, every trade they have one. Yeah, sauerkraut oh, is an, um sauerkraut is yeah. in that Europe. Sauerkraut is European. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, what? we don't put enough of our stuff on anywhere on canvas. We don't have images. So we need to start looking at, you know, all these um, platforms where you get all these images that we have other cultural foods on there, very thin on the ground. And mm. the thing about fermented foods, they're partially digested and they help with the, that gut lining, they help heal the gut lining. I'm going to share the one that we have in my country, which is okay. curry. See that there? That is a fermented food. I mean, we have so many fermented foods. <laughs> But Gary, you know, it's like you roll it into a ball. It's a swallow, that's it. It's a swallow food, and that's a fermented food. But the thing is, you need to be adding fermented foods to your diet. So why would um, a culture, why would a culture require more fermented food than another culture? Um, 
if they are why do you, why do you sorry i don't understand the question why would which culture the only reason why i say that because you said that um within your culture you yeah. have loads of different variety of fermented mm. food. and i know you're not caribbean i'm, I'm not, not too sure mm. of many within the caribbean more herbs and other things so then mm. i'm just thinking okay then it seemed like yeah every culture may have it but it seems like some cultures some groups around the world they just have more yeah they need more well, i was just wondering why would they require could why i say your so? culture why would your why would why would um, people in nigeria have so much variety dishes that are fermented yeah somebody's gonna say something before i was like has- yes can i clarify with you yes. are you saying that like cornmeal is a fermented food no when it's when it's been so um it has to be fermented. So I ever put in water and then left for a few out, left for a few days to get a bit sour, a bit gone off, basically. So call me as it is no. Um, I think was, yeah. The reason why I say that because Pemi yes. is also called blue drawers and dukunu. Yes, um, that's the one. Hey, I that's know fermented. Those words. I know those. Yes. That's yes, fermented. So, but they di- we're all from different islands. So yeah. that Lucian would say Pemi. Yeah. And the Jamaican will say blue draws. Yeah. So the identification, we've all got a different way of saying the foods in the, in the Caribbean. Yeah. Mm. So I just wanted to clarify that with you. Yeah, that is a fermented food. I just okay. couldn't bring it to my mind because I hadn't read about it. I haven't tried it's got, it. It's got coconut in it and spices. Yeah. But when it's cooked, they tend to eat it fresh on the day. But then after a few days, they put, when it's, when it's cooled down, they mm. put it in the fridge and eat it until it's finished. Yeah. And that could be a week it's in the fridge for. Yeah. And I've seen that in the Caribbean where they've made it in the night time, put it in the fridge and they eat bits on, until, until it's finished. Mm. Yeah. Well, that so is, I don't... thank you so much, Helen. Yeah. Blue Draws. I remember that name now because I thought, oh, that's a nice name for it. But thank you. So there you are, Sahu. Does that answer your question? Yeah, there are you. fermented foods, but they're called different things around the world. Um, Inuit, funnily enough, they eat fermented seal blubber. Ooh, just the thought of it makes me feel a bit unwell. But the thing is, we are all our microbes help with our gut health. So getting some fermented food, you know, some people have yogurt, kefir, you can have coconut kefir, water kefir, kombucha. Um, Kimchi is a spicy version. I find you know, a lot of my clients in Afri- Afro-Caribbean background really like kimchi because it's got chilies in there and ginger. It's really flavorful. Mm. Yeah. So I'm going to whiz past this. This is just a quick thing about food for health, choosing your food. So you have having mostly vegetables that so grow above ground, a little bit of your whole grains. But the main thing here is all the oils are coming from food. That's really quite important. So your vegetable oils, your sunflower oils, they are all damaged oils. They're all oxidized. The way they are made, they are not a health food. So whenever you can, you can cook with avocado oil or sesame oil. Those are the ones with the least damage when you cook with them. The rest of them, not so much. Your plant proteins coming from pulses. We don't eat enough pulses. Pulses are a superfood. They're full of protein, full of fiber. And people get a bit bloating after that. So we're going to cover that in a moment. Um, your animal protein, if you're having some, go for wild caught, free range. You know, just eat rare of it. I mean, now with the financial crisis, you know, meat is actually an expense that we all don't need anyway. So just a little bit around. So this plate actually was put together by um, a charity called Alliance for Health. And I work with them. And... The whole point of this is that if you're following the NHS guidelines on eating loads of carbs, it is not helping with gut health and it's contributing to all the chronic diseases we see today. And the whole premise of this is that you're eating a lot more vegetables with a little bit of fruit. Yes, I know we like fruit, but fruit in this country, we're eating them out of season. We're not not working that fructose off. So a lot of the time, especially for Afro-Caribbeans, our genes are meant to be in a hot climate. We are built for physical work. I'm not talking about slavery. That's not what I mean. We are not the sit down on the bum at a computer. We work, we are physical, we are a physical group of people. So if you're eating fruit, we're eating fruit out of season, that sugar 
So works like sugar in the body and sugar will damage your gut. So keep your fruits so minimal, eat what's in season and go for a lot more of the foods that grow above ground. Um, whatever meal you're having, this is just a little bit around just for diet. Make sure you've got some protein, carbs and fat in every meal, unless you're food combining. And when you buy foods, let's get back to buying ingredients. You know, we seem to have lost a culture of cooking. Yeah, no products. Because when you buy a product, somebody else has put that together. They have not got your health in mind. They're preparing something now you could be addicted to so you can eat more of it and make them loads of money. So let's get back to cooking the way we've always done this. Um, our, our grandparents, you know, if they saw half the things we ate, they would just think, what is this? You know, so if you look at your food, if you think, my grandma wouldn't call this food, it probably isn't food. You know, good for your minimally process. When we looked at that ultra process, you know, ultra process, a potato and a Pringle, right? <laughs> There's no relationship. A potato to a mashed potato to some fries, that's still a potato journey. So try and keep it minimally processed and make that process something you're having to do. So cooking is processing because you need to cook some things to be able to get the nutrients out. So I did mention that we didn't, people don't know with beans, but obviously because they feel bloated afterwards. But the problem they're having is that they're not preparing beans well. So on the next slide, just a quick thing around how to prepare your beans from scratch. You know, if you're soaking it, it is an acidic medium. Have a bit of lemon juice when you soak or some apple cider vinegar overnight, and then you cook your beans. It literally takes about 20 minutes. But you've got to prepare it well. Rinse your beans thoroughly. All that gassy stuff, that's what's causing bloating. Combo is um, a seaweed. You can cook with kombu, it helps soften it as well, and you're adding some necessary iodine. Cardamom and fennel, you can put that in your beans. Cardamom and fennel are called carminative herbs. They really help with gut and help you get rid of excess gas. Sprouting your pulses means the enzyme has worked a bit on it, it's partially digested and makes it much easier for you to get your nutrients. Fibre. We don't eat enough fiber. So the recommendation is about 35 grams. Now the, the Hutsi tribe in Africa eats about 150 grams of fiber a day. Fiber is what feeds all your gut microbiome. So all the bacteria in your gut, the healthy ones, all the fiber we eat, that's why I've got a toothbrush here. We don't actually digest it. We just break it down for the gut bacteria to then work on it and produce vitamins for us for to uh, make things called short chain fatty acids to feed the gut lining. So, you know, really important that we eat a lot of fiber. Well, not all fiber is equal. So let's just go through some foods. Um, fiber, when it's not soluble, also helps clean your gastrointestinal tract. So it's really important to up your fiber. Now, on this page, it's just showing you how quickly you can, this is, I think I've actually got 43 grams of fiber on this page. It is really not that hard to up your fiber, but it's really quite important for your gut health and for your overall health. So that's manageable on there, right? Easy. I am whizzing through a little bit because I have gone past 8.40. Oh, sorry, Sahu. Tell me when to stop because these things, I mean, we can talk about this, you know, just for our conversation. On oh, yeah, here, you've got some prebiotic foods. So guess what? Onions, garlic. I mean, is there, a, is there a home that doesn't have an onion garlic thing going on? When I have friends come around and all they can smell is onions and garlic, they're like, oh, that smells so good. That's most of our diet, right? But they are actually prebiotic foods. So increase that in your diet to help with your gut health. To summarize this whole section, um, I like that quote from Michael Pollan and it's, eat food, mostly plants, not too much. So should I just stop here and then, as we talk, if I need to mention supplements, we can talk about that later. I mean, you're doing brilliantly. It's so captivating. We just want you to go on and on and on. You know um, what I'm saying? We're, we're drawn <laughs> in. All right. It's not much. We've got a few slides left, actually. Just five slides. Yeah, let's work through that. Then. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we're just soaking it all up. <laughs> Fabulous. So... On there, in that it says, eat a rainbow. The rainbow is your vegetables. All those colors, all those different colors are made by, it's called polyphenols. The polyphenols feed your gut microbiome. Those bacteria, they love all of this. So a lot of the things we eat, we're not actually eating it because we can do something with it. It gets down into the large intestine, 
the microbiome, those friendly bacteria in the gut is what's gonna convert it to something the body can use. So honestly, looking after your microbiome is top, top, top tip. If that's all you do from tonight, increase your intake of fiber, you will notice a change in your health. And that's a guarantee. But it's not for everyone, but that's a no of a conversation. IBS sufferers, they're, they're going, I'm not eating that. No, they have a different way of processing fiber and it can actually be quite painful for them. So this obviously is not for um, somebody who's got IBS because they can't eat as much fiber as they would like. So when you're eating your, you know, your fruits, eat the skin as much as possible. If you're having oranges, okay, we can't, you know, we're not doing organic food because they're just that bit pricier, but you can soak everything in a mixture of bicarb in water. That will reduce a lot of the toxins on your food. So try and eat the skin of the things that you can eat the skin of. Obviously not an avocado or a coconut, you can't eat those. But the skin, we a lot of the time, the nutrients in the food is actually held just under the skin. So when you peel it away, you're losing all those nutrients. For your snacks, nuts and seeds, vegetable sticks, hummus, hummus is chickpea, really good for cholesterol as well. Pulses, easy way to put your pulses, you know, half cup full in a stew, in a soup, on salads, done. And if you're meat free, avoid the franken foods. You know, the tofurkeys, it's like, uh, I'm not sure what it is, but the name should really warn you that this is not a food. I call them franken foods because they pretend to be foods, but they're not. Coming up to the end, hydration, like we mentioned earlier before, really important, but up there on the right are a few things that are going to support your digestion. So your gentian root is a really good one for digestive support. So you have any of these before you eat, you're gonna produce enough digestive juices to get everything you need from your food. So that's really crucial. Marshmallow and peppermint are from the other side. So if you ever get heartburn, Marshmallow tea is actually a really nice calming thing to drink. It produces mucilage, it's called a mucilage. So it forms a little bit of mucus and that coats the inside. So you don't actually damage your physiology through having a bit of heartburn. Things to avoid, coffee, not only is it dehydrating, it actually is, um, reduces your stomach acid production and so do fizzy drinks and alcohol. So avoid those whenever you can. So coming up to the end, it's just this little bit about how we come to the table. I've already mentioned this. I don't need to go on anymore. So the main thing from this page is this stage here, the cephalic stage of digestion. It happens up here first. You know, when you are thinking about food or you start to chop your food and you can smell the food, you actually start to produce digestive juices, right? So if you're getting your microwave ready-made nonsense, you're not getting any of that. It's like you've popped in the oven and then you're eating it. The preparation is preparing your body to receive. So that's really important for gut health. One other thing, if you're drinking cold water with your meals, you might wanna not do that. Um, your gut is, uh, in Ayurveda, it's called Agni, it's fire. It's fire in the gut. You need, it's like a, an engine burning your food. If you need to drink, if you're say dry, have something slightly warm like a ginger tea. But it's really important going into any meal, give grace, breathe. That puts you into what's called your parasympathetic nervous system, the rest and digest. And then when you're eating, you're really giving your body the nutrients it needs in a space to allow it to absorb. So the last few place, um, pages are just some supplemental support because this is my background. Um, if you find that you're struggling, if you say you have a meal and it all sits in your gut really heavy, you might need some digestive enzyme support. Um, this one by Udo's is very nice, all plant-based. You've got your apple cider vinegar here and probiotics um, if you're not eating fermented foods. If you're having fermented foods, you don't really need probiotics, it's all in the food. More supplemental support. A lot of people seem to struggle with digesting beans. If you've prepared it well and you're still having a problem, you might want to look at this bean assist because it's going to help you digest beans. I'm a big bean person. I Bean breakfast, lunch and tea, it's just so good for you. Um, when you look at the amount of fiber in your black eyed beans or your gunga peas, we, we have good food. We just need to eat it. <laughs> um, and dandelion root is gonna support um, your kidneys. It's also gonna support your liver. So these are really quite important to have in your cupboard anyway. Bromelain is from the center of pineapple, you know, the core. It's, it's an anti-inflammatory, but it also helps with digesting protein. That's why it's an anti-inflammatory, it breaks down proteins. So if you're struggling with your meals, that's something you could have as well. 
any of these, if afterwards you think I'd like to try something, but I'm not sure how, please email me through um, Sahu or Christos and we'll take it from there. Um, all free, no obligation. We're here to support you. Finally, something for constipation. Aloe vera is amazing. I think we all know that. You can just get the leaf, chop that, soak it, get that brown stuff out, but it's really good for digestion and your gut health. Tripala, I like because it is an Ayurvedic help, helps with constipation, just helps. You know, I've talked about constipation a lot. Those are toxins. You really want this out of your system and not sitting in there. Magnesium, everyone needs to be taking magnesium. It is your chill mineral. It helps to relax, helps relax the gut, helps with the motility, helps with moving food along your digestive tract. And I think that's where we are going to stop. So I'm hoping we've covered all these. And um, now we are going to have a bit of Q&A, aren't we? Yeah. Thank no. you all so much. I'm just no, going to... Oh, yeah, you're still, we can still see you, though. That was amazing, Audra. There was a lot of information there. Along that journey there, oh, so many times I wanted to jump in and ask you a question. And, and, but I thought if I start doing that, <laughs> it would just go on for much longer than what it went on for. I'm so, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just really <laughs> passionate about health and food. But yeah, I will be shorter next time. Oh, there, do we be sure? I mean, I think everyone already knows that. Me and so you can. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're serious. Yeah, so definitely put your um your email address or any details or anything in in the chat there, so people can actually contact you. I should do that now. Yes, there, there's some questions in the chat. Um. Let you write your email first. Yeah, because you know, you know, I've been back into the CMOS recently, as I, as I see CMOS there as the most recent. Um, man, I was out of CMOS. Yeah, I was hard. I was hard. I was so hard in CMOS. I noticed that it was making me slightly dehydrated. How deep I was drinking CMOS constantly. Mm -hmm. It's like, how much can you drink water or fluid? You know. So I cut back a little bit. And then getting back into it, I, I realized the benefits of it because I haven't had it for like maybe four to six months. Mm -hmm. And it's really good on, on the bowels. I thought my bowel movement was good already, yeah? No, because it is good. But it's even better. Oh, man, when I look at what's left in the toilet, I'm like, oh, my word. That just come out of me. That's, it's, it's impressive. It is just, and the strength in the sense of um, supporting the lining. Yes. Fortifying the system. Like it gives you like an internal strength. These things are so easy to forget when you're just in it constantly. I was doing CMOS for years. This is like a habit. And the same as hemp seed oil. I'm sorry, hemp seed. I will blend it down. And then I was, these things you need a break. Most yeah. definitely. So, what was the question there, Christos? So Helen, we're gonna do with the live ones first because Helen's on camera with a hand raised up. So yeah, if, if we uh, I'll unmute you. Sorry, it's not Helen, it's Sankusa. Um sorry. Hi, <laughs> greetings. Thank you, Audra. That was amazing. I trust we're going we're going to get the video, the recording, yeah? Oh, definitely. Yeah, my gosh, it was so packed full I've got to I've got to look at that so many times um <clears throat> just a couple of things I wanted to clarify <clears throat> um you had an um, image of olives in the fermented um group uh, olives fermented that's olives are fermented okay I didn't know that that's good to know I, I, could you tell me the difference between prebiotic and probiotic so pro is the friendly bacteria and the prebiotic is the food you feed your friendly bacteria. So things like green bananas, leeks, onions, honey, they're all prebiotic food. So the pro you already have, those are your friendly bacteria in the gut. And the prebiotics, usually fiber that you feed your probiotics. Okay, thank you. Lovely. And just the last one was... Um, were you recommending drinking tea like ginger tea before you eat a meal? Um, I will do ginger tea 
afterwards but it depends i mean it's one of those things see what works for you because ginger is going to warm up your digestion anyway so if you have a sluggish digestion then having ginger tea you know 20 minutes before you eat is a good idea if you're having that stuck feeling after you've eaten then ginger tea after you've eaten is a good idea mm -hmm. okay that's lovely there's so much more i could ask but i'm going to stop that was amazing thank Thanks you for your question Sankofa. thank you um, then we've got um, Helen to theme. Thank you, Audrey. That was brilliant. Thanks, um, Helen. Joe, you think, can you go through the last slide? Um, if you can write in the chat, what exactly did you want to go through? Was there anything particular on the slide or just the whole slide? Um, we'll give you a moment to answer that. Um, Liz has put black seed oil, question mark. So is that just a general question on is the black seed oil good or is it fermented? Anything on black seed oil? Uh, black seed oil is amazing. Um, if you are, um, if you practice Islam, you know, it was given um, from the Prophet, peace be upon him. And it's really, really amazing for not only gut health, for your immune support, lung health, um, upper respiratory, anti-cancer, skin health, eczema, psoriasis, um, black seed oil is amazing, but make sure you get the cold press and it's got to be in a dark bottle because the light or heat is going to damage it. But black seed oil, I think all, especially the, with what we're going through at the moment with whatever they want to release in the air, <laughs> um, black seed oil is highly preventative. It's a really good one to have. And then Alan, Alan Solomon, his live, and wants to ask the question. Yes, go ahead. Good evening. Alan. Hey, Christos hey. and uh, Sahu and Victoria. Thank you very much for uh, an excellent presentation. Very, Thank very you. informative. Thank you. The question I wanted to ask um, was about yogurt mm -hmm. yeah? and. Um, yogurt having the live cultures in it. Now, yogurt is obviously made from milk, yeah? So if you're intolerant to um, lactose, having live culture yogurt, would that increase your um, lactose intake? Um, it would. Yeah, all right. So there is coconut milk yogurt now. You can get um, yogurt made from coconut, you can get it made from um, oat milk as well, but I wouldn't recommend oat milk. Oat milk is highly processed. But there's cocos, um, cocoa, there's just so many coconut yogurts. So um, I would just do that and not bother with dairy yogurt. Mm. Okay, I did have another question. Yep. You mentioned about um, uh, keeping the skin on, on fruit and, and veg. Yes. Uh, I once said that the healthiest part of an orange is that white fleshy bit. Um, uh, can you confirm that? Yes. So the the white, the rind, not the just underneath that yellow. So when I was growing up, I grew up in Nigeria. They used to peel. You do this lovely pattern on an orange. They take off the orange bit, and then you're left with the white bit and the rest of the orange. And that's what we used to eat. You just ate the whole thing. Lovely. So you have to go back into maybe peeling it by hand, and then you still have a little bit of the rind on there. The pith. Thank you, Kaz. <laughs> Some, someone's, someone's on the ball. Thank you. Um, yeah. Well, you're right. A lot of the um, such essential oils, as well as all the phytonutrients, are just underneath the skin. I mean, we've been known to get an orange, not all of it, but you just cut a little bit of the orange bit because that's where the essential oils are. As long as you've soaked it in bicarbonate of soda, you're not getting too many toxins and you can nibble on that as well. So you're getting more fiber, but you're also getting all the benefits of an orange. The thing to avoid is orange juice. Orange juice is not a health food. Yeah, JV King, yams that too. <laughs> I like your comments. I could just read the chat. I'm telling you. <laughs> Um, Jackie, it might be easier if you email me and then we can just have a conversation over email because there are a few questions I'll need to ask and you might not want to share the answers 
with everyone on the platform. So um, I've put my email in, in the chat and yeah, please email me and we can talk about it. There's a lot you can do, yeah. Uh, Pauline's arts is magnesium. Is, uh, by, I can't pronounce that word. <laughs> it's um, on the chat. If you go up to what type? Oh, yeah, yeah. So the magnesium is glycinate. So it's got glycine. It's got two molecules of glycine. That's actually better for sleep. Well, magnesium is magnesium. So you will get some benefit. Uh, magnesium oxide is better for, you know, remember milk of magnesia that had magnesium oxide. So that's very good for constipation. And magnesium citrate is also good. Relaxes a muscle, but it's also good for, in fact, if you're ever having constipation, a quick cheat is to, of a bit too much magnesium citrate, you will be going. <laughs> You'll be on that toilet for a bit. <laughs> but um, yeah, um, magnesium glycinate is okay for the gut, but it's going to help you more with sleep and it's more expensive. So if you have a sleep issues, then you want the magnesium by glycinate. But if not, magnesium citrate is fine. Yeah. Uh, Janet asked something about aloe vera leaf plant. I know there are different um, types of aloe vera, but I'm not sure. I know some are not quite suitable for intake and some are not so good for skin, but I, I don't know enough to give you a definitive answer. Sorry. Yeah, I think Joe wanted, um, he said he's put the whole, he or she's put the whole slide. Um, I know it's going to be on a replay um, anyway. Uh, did you want to summarise that last slide again or just go on a replay? Uh, the last question, um, Joe wanted you to go through that last slide. I don't know. Okay. Let me, shall I just answer this? So ZG, do you take have to take vitamin D3 with K2? Yes. And in fact, um, research has now shown you need to take D3 with K2 with magnesium and zinc, all four together. You can even throw calcium in there. But the D, the, everyone takes the D3, but the K2 is very important because it helps put, um, it, it helps make this protein called osteocalcin. And what that does is put calcium in your bones. So if without the K2 and you're having D3, it's basically moving calcium around, but it's going to put calcium anywhere. And I think Sahu can easily tell you guys what calcium in the wrong place will do. It's not a good thing, is it? No. So you're saying... That the, because the vitamin K2, that is, that's for the blood. Yeah, so there's K1 and K2. Yeah. So the K2 comes from, from fermented food. So our gut bacteria actually makes the K2. So that helps with blood as well, but it helps with um, the absorption of calcium. Mm. Yeah. What was the other so one? Anyway. Four of them? Or you said four? Yeah. So D3, K2. You need magnesium to metabolize D3 and you need zinc. So all four together are a good mix. And, and, that, will, and that will improve your um, gut immunity. motility? Um, immunity more. Immunity. More immunity okay. support okay. and cardiovascular health and bone health. That's going to work on. Yeah. yeah. I think you've got this very nice um, multivitamin powder at Planet, Planet Organic. Um, I think you showed me mm. immunity and it, it had all of those compounds. And I mean, yeah, it's, it's, some, it's some good stuff. I forgot what it's called, but I know you can get these, you know, some of these supplements with all of these things in it, all the multivitamins. Yeah. I mean, Zaydee, you've asked about vitamin D3. So for dark skin, we need to be doing about 3,000 to 4,000 IU till summer. And lighter skin, you can do 2,000 IU. Obviously, come the summer, you need to be out in the sun. That's the best. But it, the D3 from the sun, you need to be in summer. The sun has to be like overhead, like 12, uh, 12 o'clock is overhead. That's the best way time to get your D3. And try and expose, you know the areas that you always have cloned? Those are the bits you need to actually expose to the sun for your D3. Yeah. So a bit of naked sunbathing, anyone? <laughs> Not so much. <laughs> What I wanted to ask, Audrey, because I think this is an important point. I know you were mentioning about the 80 20% rule. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of active people, they feel that, you know, they have to get in a little bit more nutrients. And 
you know, when I see clients, I always kind of tell them, okay, yes, you know, you're adding in your extra, maybe not so great foods to bolster whatever you need to bolster. But in my um, experience, especially training a lot and in the semi-pro days and et cetera, mm-hmm. I found that if I ate something good and then ate something bad, I would seem to be very fine with the bad that I've eaten. Whereas if I've eaten something bad first and then something good, something happens. Yeah. So is it just the 80, 20% or is it, does it matter the order of how you do things? I think well? the order matters. You know, it's like that thing of, if you put your finger in cold water and then you put it in hot water, it feels very hot. It feels mm. hotter than if you just put it in the hot water. So it's the same way, I think. If you're mm-hmm. having, I mean, uh, I would say no food is bad in itself. It's all about the effect it has on you, mm-hmm. right? So there are some people who can eat all kinds of stuff and it doesn't actually impact them so negatively. So it's about what's the effect of the food on you. I, I do think eating something that agrees with you is much better because when you eat stuff that is bad, you create inflammation in the body. So already there's inflammation in your gut, your gut is not happy, or your um, immune cells are fired thinking they're under attack. Then whatever you eat next, it doesn't make a difference because you're already setting the inflammatory or inflammatory cascade has started. So eating something good after that is not really going to touch the sides. And this is a question for someone I know in regards to eczema. Mm -hmm. Now, is eczema... Is it a condition or is it more of a symptom of Um, many things that could be going wrong? Yeah, I think it's more of a symptom. Mm -hmm. So eczema has got links with the gut. It's got links with how the person um, does vitamin A, vitamin D. It has a, a, a place in inflammation. It's got something to do with past trauma, so emotional trauma. It has a picture in stress. So usually most conditions are just telling you that there's a problem. So what we need to be doing is looking at what's causing the problem. We tend to go and fix the problem on the outside. We go and treat the symptom. But actually, you know, when people put corticosteroid creams on eczema, that's treating the symptom. You have to peel back and go back to the gut, clean out the gut, put Mm -hmm. the foods it needs in, heal the lining. You have to do all of those steps and then you might see... um, a result what well, plastering things on top so treating the condition i feel doesn't really make a difference because once you stop that treatment it all comes back so you haven't really done anything you just suppress them yeah it looks like ashana's got a question um you're unmuted ashana uh, hi good night it's been a very good presentation but i have a question about vitamin d Mm-hmm. You mentioned earlier in regards to trying to stay away from certain synthetic products because the body doesn't have the ability to absorb it. Mm-hmm. But isn't vitamin D synthetic and where do you draw the line and the balance between consuming that? The D3, I recommend, is not synthetic. It's called colicalsilferol and it's made, it's taken from the lanolin in sheep. So um, a lot of the ones by Nature's Answer, they do a D3 in olive oil that's not synthetic. Um, you can normally tell it's synthetic from what it says on the back. But if it's got the proper name, polycus calciferol, then that is not synthetic. But okay, you're right. Thank you. I always avoid synthetic things. You know, man, we've gotten a bit arrogant. We think we can replace everything. We, we, we can't. <laughs> we, just, we just can't. Well, thanks for that. That was a really good question. Thank you. Oh, is that, I think Joe's narrowed down their question. Um, they were saying you were saying something about on your the last slide bloating or constipation. Okay. Um, just a brief summary of what what you said there. Yeah, definitely. And I believe someone wanted to ask a question as well. If you just raise your hand, and then we will allow you to ask your question in a moment. I'm just answering Nature's Answers. Nature's Answer, D3. 
And anyone else as well for um to ask the question? Just raise your hand. Shame we can't see your faces. We're just talking to names. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Je Janet. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Um yeah. can, sorry that my connection keep cutting out. Audra, when you explained the simple way that you can test the stomach acid, you was then yeah. bicarbonate. Yeah, and so then, um, mm. you can do a quarter teaspoon of bicarbonate of soda mm -hmm. in a little bit of water, like 100 mils of water, first yeah. thing in the morning. Mm -hmm. You drink that, and then you time how long it takes you to burp. Okay. If it takes you under five minutes, you're fine. It mm -hmm. just means, you know, then maybe look at the chewing your food properly, maybe not drinking with food or don't have coffee. Yeah. But if it's taking longer than five minutes, anything after five minutes, you need to support um, your stomach acid production. Okay. When it's between like five and 10 minutes, just having those bitter foods I mentioned mm -hmm. or apple cider vinegar, mm -hmm. that can actually make a big impact. That can really help. When it's over 10 minutes, then you probably need some enzyme support. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. And I've emailed you. <laughs> that was quick. Okay. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. I don't know Sarah C. Do you do anybody know what Sarah C is? So it's a question from Liz. Yeah, Sarah C is one of those Caribbean herbs for the gut or for the um if you got a um is it? I think to move your bowels, really. The thing's really bitter. It's oh, yeah. Very bitter. It's very oh, bitter. Yeah. Extremely. Uh, so say that again. Um, I thought it came from the aloe vera plant. Bitter melon. Yes. I know bitter melon. That's very good stuff. Very good stuff for digestion. Good for a cleanse as well. Yes, I agree with you, Kaz. Good stuff. So, um, who's that, Sally? Yeah, Kaz is saying not too much or too often because, yeah, you will actually really hurt your stomach. I think, um, yeah, Carilla, and I think Asian culture is called Carilla, but it's bitter melon. Yeah, you're right. Thank you so much. See, when we start talking, all this knowledge we have just starts to come out. There's nothing that I've shared today that you don't already know. All I've done is just make it concise and then look at you. You're coming up with all the things. Yeah. Hope you're using these though. Because if you have this, you're not having a digestive problem. We, we, have, we have got these resources. It's like self-prescription and um, knowing when to use these things. It's listening to the body and trying to apply the right alchemy or the right chemistry or the, to the body at the right time. This is what I'm um, advocating. Hi, can I ask a question? Who's that, Sully? No, it's Francine. Francine, go for it, lovely. Let's hear your question. Hi, good evening. Good evening. <laughs> um, hi, I was just wondering, is there, what would you suggest to open up somebody's appetite for like a fussy eater? So, um, is there anything to you So which one is it? Fussy eater, because fussy eaters, that's just a whole battle. <laughs> well, but it's so my um, autistic son, so he's class. I would say he's extremely selective with what he eats. Yes. And I want to open up his appetite because he's not getting enough vitamins and nutrients. Or would you recommend a certain vitamin supplement that I can give to him? He's eight and I'll be sure as possible, but with as much nutrients and vitamins as possible. I mean, and as you know, um, children with you know neurodiverse children are the fussiest. They can taste the tiniest. Where we try and sneak in, it's like, oh, I can taste yeah. that. One molecule in a sea of whatever, <laughs> and they can tell you, I can tell you, put a drop of something I don't want in there. So yeah. it's really challenging. So there are there's a liquid um, supplement called um, Liquid Gold, and they do one for children, but it's whether it's going to have it or not. That's the thing. There are, are things available. Royal jelly, if it's not allergic to um, bees, royal jelly builds appetite because that's what they feed the, the queen. The queen bee gets fed royal jelly and look how well they grow, you know. So yeah, I mean, royal jelly is a good one. 
but you'd have to start with just a drop because you don't know how he's going to react. Yeah, if it's in a liquid form, I can yeah. give it to him in a syringe. Yeah. But, but if it's not a liquid to start with, yeah, okay. Yeah. There is um, there oh. are some liquids, um, you know, multivitamins, multinutrients, and the one by um, Nature's Plus is a good one. Okay. Yes, I've got that one. I think I believe I've got that in the orange. It's like an orange. Color. Yeah. Yeah. Have, yeah. Has he touched that one? He hates it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Mama. No, I, I, I would like to say, yep, there is this thing that you can do, and okay. um, but sometimes, I mean, if you have him balum, come in with him because I have this way with young people sometimes, you know, because they get it, you know, yeah. they they get it, they they. They intuit quite a lot, you know, and just, um, you know, sometimes a stranger giving them a challenge, they tend to rise to it. It's no good you saying it, but a yeah. stranger says, hmm, have you tried this? Let's have a challenge. Who can eat this more? You know. Yeah. You know, have you heard of something called zeolite? Yes. Zio <sighs> would you suggest that? I would, actually. Okay. It's been shown um, to really support um, neurodiverse children. Okay. Because they're saying there's quite a lot of um, toxins in the brain. Yeah. And the gut brain, <laughs> sorry, Sahu, you said we're going to talk about the gut brain axis, but well, that's implicated in neurodiverse. Yeah, it's implicated a lot. Okay. Where, where are you based, Francine? I'm in Sutton. In so, Scotland? No, Sutton. Just Sutton, <laughs> just Scotland. Past, just past. <laughs> Mitchum. Okay. Mitchum. Well, please take note of my email. Then let's let's have a chat because there are a few things we can try. Okay. Yeah. I will do. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thanks for your oh so zeolite, I'll spell it Z O Light like that. Z E O, yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I want to come off now. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good to see you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Well, we've covered a lot of stuff this evening. I think we are um, going to start winding down. Is there any more, a few more questions if anyone wants to go through? You can raise your hand, come forward. Especially as we, um, oh, wow, oh, gosh. Back to that 20, um, 80%, I was thinking as well. Yeah. You know, we, we look at that. Um, I look at that also as a plate of food. I look at that as um, the stuff that I'm intaking generally, let's say a, yeah. an observation through the day, um, 80 to 20%. I'm looking at as an observation, sometimes in smaller portions, whether within an hour, I've got stuff to do, you know? Mm -hmm. It's this 20, 80, it's 80% 80 um, good stuff. And uh, the 20%, yeah. okay. That twenty percent, whatever it is, yeah, I look at that like almost every meal, every opportunity of ingesting food. We're trying to incorporate mm. that awareness there. It's such a powerful tool. I'm glad you mentioned that as well. Mm. Sometimes we're unsure. You know, you can have a plate of food and have um, all these vegetables, and then have, let's say, if you're eating meat, then just have a small piece of meat. But then that twenty yeah. percent, yeah, of meat that's on that plate, that can even disappear to 100% vegetables and that 20% can re-emerge back in. So that, that, yeah. that 100, that 20, 80, I, liked, I used to, and I still do, play with that, that technology a lot. <laughs> so I think Oshauna's raised her hand to ask a question. Go for it, Oshauna. Unmute yourself, Oshauna, and then ask, um, I have a question about what would be the best vitamin C to take. The reason I ask that is because I'm aware there's certain vitamin C that can irritate the bowels. And yeah. I think they say it does pull on any reserve nutrients or iron that you may have in the stomach lining. So what would you recommend as the best vitamin C to prevent that? So I would say the best vitamin C is actually in food. So your baobab powder. That's a really good source. That's from an African tree, about yay big, huge trunk. And that's got a nice amount of vitamin C. Camu camu powder, that's also a, a plant. If you're going for a supplement, there's um, 
these liquid, they're called liposomal. So they're basically vitamin C molecules wrapped in fat. They don't upset the stomach, but because your cell membrane is fatty, you know, our cell membrane is made of fat and fat absorbs fat. It helps absorb it much better and it stays in your system for a lot longer. Um, we need to avoid, I think it's ascorbic acid. That's what you're talking about. Ascorbic acid will irritate the gut. You can do the buffered ascorbic acid. And when it's buffered, it's been mixed with, it's called um, chelation. It's been mixed with an, um, a mineral. So it stops it being so acidic. But I do feel the best bet is actually going from food, you know, that your body's going to just use it really well. But liposomal is second to intravenous vitamin C, liposomal second, and then your food-based um, vitamin C is third, and then the rest fall in. Can you repeat question. the powder? I mostly about bao powder, but what was the other? Oh, yes. Let me write it on here. Bao, bao great name. And... I think, it, no, no, I think it's Camu, Camu, like that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your question. Um, Liz has asked about what do I think of CBD hemp, THC for pain or inflammation. Well, CBD works really well with inflammation, with pain, with anxiety in your nervous system. We have a, excuse me, an endocannabinoid system. It's not like you're introducing something and the body doesn't recognize we actually have a system that responds to CBD. Um, the hemp, I don't think, um, if it's just hemp oil, I don't think you get as much as if you have in CBD because it's got the cannabinoids and it, hemp hasn't. Um, you're not going to find, I can't recommend on THC because of my license. So I um, really propelled not to speak about THC, but it has its uses in pain and in cancer. So all good for inflammation is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. And it's interesting that the same plant in it, but different parts of it. Because the hemp itself, is it not the, the minerals and the, the, the vitamins? And I'm sure, what is it? The human body requires, um, I believe the number is like 100 or maybe 99 essential minerals and elements. And the hemp itself has, mm -hmm. thing, I believe, all of them, if mm -hmm. not barring one or two, which is yeah. a bit similar to bladder See, and CMOS. 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 Yeah. It's got 99 nutrients. So yeah. I call CMOS the multivitamin, multinutrient of the sea. And then you've got shilajit, which comes from Himalayan, and that's the multivitamin and multinutrient from the soil. So between those two, you're covered. Mm -hmm. Shilajit. I write it. Shilajit. Yeah. Are we going to do this again? I think we're going to have to do this again, aren't we? Well, well these other topics that we was, um, were going to talk about, we're gonna, we can't talk about them today. We're going to have to talk about <laughs> these topics again in a few weeks' time, especially this irritable bowel syndrome. And then... Yeah. The, um, the different aspects that affect the body, the constipation or the um, bloating, but also ways to alleviate it. Because one of the things I've been thinking in my mind as well is, is ways to alleviate gut stress. Let's say you're, you've got anxiety and you're, you're, you've had a stressful day mm -hmm. and the, the, that stress has tightened up the body, therefore tighten up the gut a little bit. And then you've gone to bed with this tension in your abdominal region, woke up in the morning and unable to go to the toilet. But it's not something that maybe the person's thinking about, you know, mm -hmm. carry on through the day, same stress and anxiety through that day there, body's tightened up. So, you know, for a process like this now, because you know from, from myself, it's going to be some kind of massage or some kind of activity, some kind of um, mindfulness. What would you suggest for a person Who's, whether it's family, friends, whether it's stress at work, but mm -hmm. for their anatomy, it affects their gut. Because you know, everyone has their Achilles heel. Everyone has yes. the part of their anatomy that when they experience stress, it resonates to that, that area of their body. Mm. What would you suggest for somebody who's going through stress? Because sometimes... Ooh, they think, yeah. that's, a, that's a long one. <laughs> oh my word! <laughs> with two minutes to go. That is a, a quick fire answer. <laughs> it's quite, it's, it's multi. It. Um, yeah, there's just so many bits to it. Um, the first thing I would do is look at, you know, take out some inflammatory foods, take out anything that's 
contributing to any stress. So if you're having dairy, gluten, I would say take those out. You, might, you mentioned mind-based um, stress reduction techniques. Um, I would, I, would, I mean, with stress, because if you're in stress, you can't absorb anything. So even trying to put foods back in, till you've dealt with stress and what's causing your stress, that's where you have to start. There isn't really any shortcuts because, you know, stress will, like when I've had customers, or clients come to me looking for um, fertility, but they've got the woman's working 60 hours a week, really stressed and explain to her, is that thing again, I always like to use a lion chasing you. You're not going to stop and have sex if you're in danger. That's how the body, the body wants to keep you safe. Yeah. So if you're trying to make babies or you have a very stressful life, it's going to be a struggle, you know? So maybe we use that as the link for next time we talk because that's a lot to cover in there and there's, I can't answer, give a quick answer. That quick answer was still very broad. It was nice because those are the things we do have to pay attention to. But sometimes we're not aware of what process to take, you know, what avenue. We're just going through it constantly, but there's no break. Yeah. I think, oh, Shauna, it looks like this might be the last question then. Oh, Shauna, you have another I don't question? have a question, sorry. Okay. Um, Liz, because I know I saw you wanted to ask something earlier on, Liz. Okay, go for it. Uh, it's about Moringa. It's about oh, about the Moringa seeds? The powder, um, the seeds. Oh, it's such a... So we have such good food. Yeah. So it's high in vitamin A or the beta carotene. So it's going to help with skin health, eye health, um, good source of calcium. It's going to support microbiome. Really nice one to put into a smoothie. It's good for a cleanse. I mean, the thing is, you know, Mother Africa has produced so many wonderful, wonderful, wonderful things that we can use and have access to. And it's really for us to leave pharmaceutical you know, pharmaceuticals good for, or even NHS, if you need an x-ray or something's broken or something is cutting out, but we need to get back into having our herbs and foods because that's where a lot of our healing is going to lie. And then having people, you know, sort out the, the bone structure and the physiology because all of that all works together. But um, yeah, moringas are really, uh, I can't talk enough about it because this one I'm pulling out of my head right now, but it is a good, it's a good, um, plant it's not a herb is it it's a plant yeah yeah sorry liz it's probably not enough um for your question but maybe next time and it depends on what part you're using isn't it, with these herbs whether the seed yeah the the, the, the stem itself i haven't really heard about the root being used for moringa though no i haven't really heard that that mm, interesting no i haven't well, give everyone in, who's, who's still here, um, give give Audra some ones, some some um, hey there up. Show her your love. Thank you. That, yeah, man. It's been was... my absolute joy. Thank you so much, Christoph, mm -hmm. for having me. Really, really and really um, yeah, <laughs> I think that's a good thing. All the ones. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Oh. Audra, we're going to have to have you back definitely in the um, next few weeks. Okay. And then go into this. Because what we were talking about before as well, connection between the gut and the mind and how yeah. the mind itself can be unbalanced or um, lack of clarity, um, brain fog. Yeah. yeah. We're also looking at as well um, gut and fatigue and gut and sleeping. So these yeah. are the things I think we're going to cover next time when, when Audra come back, most definitely. Anything to say there, Christos? And Audra? Brilliant. Thank you very much. Everyone loved it. <laughs> you got my email, so just send me some questions. Even topics you want us to talk about and cover, very yeah. happy to do that, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, definitely. We do like to be led by the community and yeah. feed the community the knowledge, the food that they need, food of the gut, but food of the mind, mm. fill it all up. Yeah. <laughs> food for thought. You know what I'm saying? Oh, thank you. Well, I think we are, um, I think we are finished this evening. We are. 
So mm -hmm. do you want to stay on afterwards? I just need to check some things with you. Okay, definitely. And Christos, please. Yeah, well, well, I, I'll, I'll put us in a freeway call. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, okay. all right, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. I wish you in two weeks' time. Yeah. Okay, Sahu, I'll see you Saturday. Yeah, see you Saturday as well. All right. <laughs> wonderful evening, everyone. Hello, have a good evening. Good evening. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, bye, bye.